Shalom. This week we are reading Parashat Shalach, the fourth Torah portion in the book of Bamidbar, beginning in Numbers chapter 13. The Torah portion of Shalach is all about the grievous sin of the ten out of twelve spies who went to do reconnaissance of the land of Canaan before the arrival of their brethren, the children of Israel. They were distinguished and righteous men, at least at the time of their departure, as Rashi emphasizes, each one a leader, a prince of his tribe. Our sages teach us that this mission of spying wasn't God's idea. It was the desire of the people, and God acquiesced. We read, Moshe sent them to spy out the land of Canaan, when he said to them, Ascend here in the south and climb the mountain. See the land, how is it, and the people that dwells in it? Is it strong or weak? Is it few or numerous? And how is the land in which it dwells? Is it good or bad? And how are the cities in which it dwells? Are they open or are they fortified? And how is the land? Is it fertile or is it lean? Are there trees or not? You shall strengthen yourselves and take from the fruit of the land. The days were the season of the first ripe grapes. So they returned from spying out the land at the end of 40 days. They went and came to Moshe and to Aaron and to the entire assembly of the children of Israel, to the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh, and brought back the report to them and the entire assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They told him and said, we came to the land to which you sent us, and it is flowing with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. However, the people who inhabit the land are mighty, and the cities are extremely huge and fortified, and there we saw even the offspring of the giant. The Amalekites dwell in the south, while the Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountainous region. The Canaanites dwell on the coast and alongside the Jordan. Kalev silenced the people, to hear about Moshe, and he said, We can surely go up and take possession of it, for we can indeed overcome it. But the men who went up with him said, We are unable to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. They spread an evil report about the land which they had scouted, telling the children of Israel, The land we pass through to explore is a land that consumes its inhabitants, and all the people we saw in it are men of stature. There we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, descended from the giants. In our eyes, we seemed like grasshoppers, and so were we in their eyes. It exhausts me just to read these verses. So we all know what happened. As chapter 14 continues, the entire assembly raised up its, and issued its voice. The people wept that night. This was a terrible disaster of unprecedented proportions. In short, on account of the spies' evil and slanderous and unfounded negative report, which the entire nation, but not the women, the women did not participate in this sin, and they did not accept the Lashon Hara, they did not believe it, but other than them, all the men, the entire nation accepted these words, and because of this, God decreed that this entire generation would not enter into the land, but only their children, the very children whom they feared would be slain, they would enter. As our sages teach, Hashem declared that because the nation cried that night for no reason, this would be established as a night of crying. And indeed, this was the first Tisha B'Av, the ninth of Av, which was to become later in history the day of the destruction of the Holy Temple and many other calamities that befell the nation of Israel on this day. All because the people of Israel, goaded on by these men, showed contempt for the precious land, as King David summarizes in Psalms 106.24. Every year, we are hard-pressed to understand what really happened here. What was the cause that brought about the crisis, crisis of confidence, apparently, suffered by these men who started out as righteous leaders? Was it an emotional or nervous breakdown? There are so many different teachings and lessons regarding this sin of the spies. It's so central in the Torah's worldview and in our understanding of the universal existential angst of the Jewish people. Our sages teach us that this sin, speaking evil, against the land of Israel was more severe in God's eyes than even the idolatry of the golden calf, for which he forgave his people. But because the land of Israel represents the very honor of God himself in this world, Hashem decreed that this was the final and fatal flaw of this enigmatic, righteous, and yet flawed generation. And it was such a serious transgression that it constantly revisits the people of Israel and needs rectification in every generation. Boy, don't we feel it. But today, I would like to keep it simple. 
and bring this to a practical lesson, the practical application for all of us. So I'm asking you to open up your hearts in the deepest way. You know, examining the verses regarding the incident of the spies, their actions and their statements don't seem to be that bad. I mean, they traveled throughout the land for 40 days and truthfully reported what they saw. They really and truly did see giants there, and everywhere they went, they saw people dying. As Rashi cites from the Talmud, they reported to the people that wherever we passed, we found them burying dead, because the Holy One, blessed be He, intended this for good, to keep the local people occupied with their mourning so they should not notice them, the spies. But it appeared to them the situation in the land was not good. So we could ask, why was their punishment and the collective punishment the nation received for crying so severe? But Lashon Hara, evil speech, is not a lie, as some people think. It's the truth, but it's from an improper perspective. And this is all about perspective. Now you know that the Haftarah, the prophetic reading for this week's Torah portion, comes from the book of Joshua, chapter 2. It's another incident of spies that were sent in advance of the children of Israel, and this time by Joshua, just prior to the entrance of the children of Israel into the land. But this time the story is completely different, and so is the ending. Joshua only sends two spies, and man, they were discovered that very night and pursued. In our parashat Shalach, the spies spent 40 days in the land, schlepping huge clusters of fruit with them, and nobody discovered them. In the book of Joshua, even after they were discovered, they continued their mission. They came back and told everyone, the land is in our hands, and everyone is afraid of us, and it's not going to be any problem. But in the parsha, in our parsha Shalach, although all went well, and the spies remained undetected for 40 days in spite of the entire land, they were convinced, and they convinced the nation, that they don't have a chance. So the spies themselves are demonstrating huge differences in their approaches in these parallel episodes. And two spies didn't succeed in hiding for one day, but the original 12, 12 spies traversed the entire land for 40 days without being discovered. Yet they were totally crestfallen and convinced of their own defeat in advance. So open up your heart. In our parsha, what happened here? Hashem arranged that the spies would not be discovered. God arranged targeted assassination. He arranged for the deaths of everyone in whose proximity these men came, as we learned, as we cited from the Talmud Tractate Sota that Rashi mentions. And all the locals were so preoccupied with burials, there's no better distraction than being involved with mourning, they were so preoccupied that no one had any mind to pay attention to anything else. So our spies saw funerals taking place everywhere, everywhere they went. And they understood that there was something wrong with this picture. And actually, with their own eyes, they actually saw Hashem helping them, or what should have been what they saw. Listen carefully what could have been what they saw with their own eyes. But no, <clears throat> they proved to be dysfunctional. They returned in a devastated state, and they wrought devastation, saying, this is a land that consumes, that devours its inhabitants. They chose to see the negative and understood that because people were dying, it means it's a bad land, because it's possible to see something and yet to understand it completely differently than Hashem Himself intends. We all have a choice to see good or bad, positive or negative. It all depends on perspective and the way we choose to take things. So God arranged amazing divine providence for these men, and they had seen incredible wonders. This is the generation that left Egypt. And in our lives, too, there is daily divine providence, and whoever opens their eyes can see Hashem making miracles for each one of us daily and delivering us from evil. But one can also interpret events and circumstances in a negative light. But when we choose to see the bad, we are sticking to negativity by choice, and therefore it will stick to us. If we would only make the choice, we would see the good in everything. Listen, is your heart open? We each of us create our own reality. The spies recount everything they saw in the land to the children of Israel. They tell how they saw the Nephilim, the children of the giants. They describe themselves as seeing themselves as grasshoppers in their own eyes 
and in the eyes of those Nephilim as well, as the Torah states, Numbers 13, verse 32. We were like grasshoppers in our eyes, and so were we in their eyes. Why does the Torah specify how they felt about themselves and then go on and tell us how they appeared in the eyes of the Nephilim? How did they even know how they appeared in someone else's eyes? You know, we think of reality as something solid and fixed, something we have no control over. But the truth is that the Torah is teaching us an important lesson. A person can determine the reality of his surroundings. Our perception of the reality of our surroundings is the reality that we ourselves create based on our own inner world. The recurrent themes of our lives, the things that we struggle with, however valiantly or not, sometimes winning and sometimes losing, the things that we anticipate being good at and the things that we are convinced in advance that we will be failures at, these cycles repeat themselves and become the default template of our existence. The manifestation of the limitations that we place upon ourselves as a result of our own disbelief. Choice is a scary thing. The Torah says, choose between blessing and curse, between life and death, choose life. What people do to themselves is crazy. We're saying something very deep here, that this episode of the spies didn't have to go like this. It was their choice. Every person establishes the pattern of his life which will determine the shape of his reality. Thus a person draws down onto his life a particular reality which will be the narrative of his life. And a person's fears, as we see in the case of the spies, can shape their reality into a fearful one. Lack of faith leads to crisis and is an invitation to negativity. This is direct cause and effect. In Psalms 121, verse 5, King David teaches us, he says, Hashem is your guardian. Hashem is your shadow at your right side. Our sages expound upon this verse. What does this mean, Hashem is your shadow? A shadow does what I do, right? I do something and the shadow does it. The shadow imitates me. I initiate and the shadow follows suit. So what does this mean for my relationship with Hashem, that Hashem is my shadow? So the Holy Baal Shem Tov explained that this is the law of reciprocity, Hashem's governance of midah keneged midah, measure for measure. We receive back what we do, and everything we do, we really do to ourselves. Because Hashem engages us according to our own narrative. Like the famous Hasidic expression says, think good and it will be good. Actually, the Holy Rabbi Nachman of tells, tells it like this, he says, a person says to his friend, how you doing? And the truth is that that fellow is not having such an easy time. Well, I ruined the story. It goes like this. <laughs> he says to his friend, how you doing? And the truth is that he's having a pretty good time, but he complains. So he says, actually, it's not so good. So Hashem looks at this person and he says, you think that's not good? I'll show you what's not good. But conversely, Rabbi Nachman says, a person says to his friend, how are you doing? And the truth is that he's not having such a good time. Things are going difficult. But he says, thank God, I'm breathing, everything is good, I couldn't be better, Baruch Hashem, everything is good. So then Hashem looks at that person and he says, you think that's good? I'll show you what's good. So our thoughts, our emotions, and our inner world causes our surroundings to react. We inform our own reality with our own inner essence. When a person thinks positively, when a person's worldview is based on the joy of living in Hashem's world and the joy of emunah, of faith and trusting Hashem, such a person receives heavenly aid. Emunah means that a person will perceive reality in a more positive light and consequently, everything really does change for the better. It's not an illusion. That they were seen as grasshoppers in the eyes of the giants, that was an illusion of their creation. And it was based on their own negative self-image. But through Amuna, through belief in Hashem, faith in Hashem, the impossible becomes possible. But we are sometimes so used to living in the negative reality that we've created for ourselves that we can't imagine another one. Everyone just lives their lives of quiet desperation. But an outlook of Amuna could change the true nature of our lives. When the spies relate to the children of Israel that they saw the giants, they describe how reality appeared to them through their own eyes. Once fear took over, 
and they were convinced that they must look like grasshoppers, then, lo and behold, the giants really did see them as grasshoppers. Thus, they described themselves as such in their eyes. What would have happened if they had seen themselves as strong and heroes, superheroes, and steadfast? It would have been a different story. The giants would have seen them as such, and they would have been in fear of them. The moment we see ourselves from the limited perspective that we create for ourselves, that is what we broadcast to our environment, and that is the frequency that the world around us picks up. The best way to guarantee failure is to believe that you're destined to fail. That is negative emuna. that is emuna in failure, instead of emuna in Hashem. And it creates the negative reality. If fixing the sin of the spies is a spiritual responsibility of every generation, perhaps our generation is better equipped than those of our ancestors. Science now <coughs> teaches us that reality is influenced by intent, and quantum physics confirms that consciousness creates reality. So Hashem created us all with tremendous potential, and we must never give up on ourselves. And one thing that the spies teach us is that at the moment we do give up on ourselves, we seal our fate. It is our emuna that enables us to succeed and bring positive energy into our lives. The more we place our faith in Hashem, the more we merit to His providence, which will direct our lives in positive directions. As we mentioned earlier, everybody knows the main sin of the spies was that they showed disdain and contempt for the land of Israel, which King David calls the precious land. So one thing is for sure, our generation really needs to fix the sin of malicious slander against the precious land of Israel. So here's an eternal lesson for this week's Torah portion. Again, the Holy Rabbi Nachman, who constantly expressed his deepest love for the land of Israel, he cryptically declared, to whatever place I travel throughout my life, wherever I go, I am traveling to the land of Israel. Traveling to the land of Israel and successfully thwarting the recurring disaster of the spies also incorporates an inner journey informed by our perception of ourselves, in turn formed by our perception of Hashem, meaning our level of emunah, of faith in Him, which is the, re the reflection of our relationship. And so it is for us today, facing our enemies, those who come against the precious land. Our perception of ourselves, are we grasshoppers or are we men, is informed by our perception of Hashem in our lives. Hashem who acts as a protective shadow to our rights. And our emunah, our faith in Him, and faith in His faith in us, is the key. It's the key to the land of Israel and the key to a successful, positive, healthy, good life in the good land.